So I hope you all have had a good week and had a lot of smiles and laughs and had fun. That's what the Buddha's practice is all about. So many people have the wrong idea when they read the Four Noble Truths. I gave a, a talk one time at a Zen place. And the guy started the talk by slamming his hand on the floor and saying, all life is suffering. And I couldn't, I couldn't put up with that. So I said, that's a wrong interpretation. There is suffering in life. And the Zen master got really angry. And then I said, and I'm more interested in the third noble truth than I am the first. There's a way to get out of the suffering. So that's a, it was kind of an amazing experience to see how attached some people are to the idea that all life is suffering. I mean, how many experiences, whether you've done any meditation or not, how many experiences have you had where something really nice happened and it made you happy? Is that suffering? Well, they would say, yes, because it doesn't last. Well, it doesn't last because you don't keep it going with your generosity and helping other people overcome their suffering. Anyway, I'm going to do Sutta number 152, the development of the faculties. This is one that I haven't done for a while, but I remember it as being quite a nice sutta. And it's a new one for most people. Thus have I heard on one occasion, a blessed one was living in Kanjagala in the grove of Muhel, Muhelu wait, uh, trees. Never heard of that kind of tree, but that's India anyway. Then the Brahmin student Uttara, a pupil of the Brahmin, oh, all of these foreign names, Parasarati, Saratya, went to the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side. The Blessed One then asked him, Uttara, what does a Brahmin, I'm not going to say his name again, teach his disciples? Do, and, and not what does. Does the Brahmin teach his disciples the development of the faculties? He does, Master Gotama, but Uttara, how does he teach the disciples the development of the faculties? Here, Master Gotama, one does not see forms with the eyes. One does not hear sounds with the ears. That is how the Brahman teaches his, his disciples the development of the faculties. And with all the meditation, different teachers and that sort of thing, 
they have this idea, a lot of them have this idea that the way you guard your sense faculties is by not using them. Like you can not use your ears if you hear a sound. It's going to happen whether you want it to or not. How do you shut it down? How do you suppress it? And it goes that way with all of the faculties. I had uh, one friend, I was in Burma. In Burma, they have uh, different ways of uh, getting rid of a lot of uh, rainwater. So they have open trenches, their cement open trenches right in the middle of the walkways. And this monk decided he was going to close his eyes down. So he closed his eyes while he was doing walking meditation. And he walked too far. And he fell into one of these ditches and broke his leg. So that says something about, whoops, that doesn't work. Let's try something that does work. Let's, let's pay a bit, little bit of attention to what we're, we're doing while we do it. We have to use our sense faculties, whether we want to or not. If that is so, Uttara, then a blind man and a deaf man will have developed his faculties. According to what your, your teacher says, for a blind man does not see forms with the eye and the deaf man does not hear sounds with the ear. When this was said, the Brahmin student Uttara sat silent, dismayed, with shoulders drooping and head down, glum and without response. Then knowing this, the Blessed One addressed the Venerable Ananda. Ananda, the Brahman teaches his disciples the development of the faculties in one way. But in that the Noble One's dis discipline, The supreme development of the faculties is otherwise. Now is the time, blessed one. Now is the time, sublime one, for the blessed one to teach the supreme development of the faculty in the noble one's discipline. Having heard it from the blessed one, the monks will remember it. Then, Ananda, attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, venerable sir, he replied, the blessed one said this. Now, Ananda, how is there the supreme development of the faculties of the noble one's discipline? Here, Ananda, when a monk sees a form with the eye, there arises in him what is agreeable. There arises what is disagreeable. There arises what is both agreeable and disagreeable. I would, I would use the word neither in that case, but, or either in that case. He understands thus, there has arisen in me what is agreeable. There has arisen in me what is disagreeable. There has arisen in me what is both agreeable and disagreeable, neutral. But that is condition, gross, dependently arisen, this is peaceful, this is sublime, that is equanimity. 
Now, all of the meditation that you do, when you're recognizing hindrances and you're using the six R's, is you're developing your equanimity. This is not so openly talked about by most meditation teachers. And um, the, the meditation teachers that I've been to, when they get done with the retreat and we're ready to, to go, they always say something to the effect of, now just be mindful, trying to mean that you be mindful with your daily activities, but they never discuss how to do it. They think by your practice, you're supposed to know how to do it. But when I get in, at the end of the retreat, I tell people to keep smiling because this improves your equanimity. And it improves your equanimity with your daily activities. So all of your life is part, is part of a meditation. When you develop this kind of balance with whatever is happening. I still have some work to do because my heart started beating real fast when I started thinking about this, the suit I was going to be getting, getting, giving. And I uh, got a little excited and that made my heart beat faster. And that took some of the breath away that's happening in me right now. So, I guess the moral of the story is don't get old and be mindful all the time. <laughs> so the thing that that's most important is the equanimity, the balance of light of, of everything in life. When you start to get excited about something that's not right, Where's your mindfulness? Or do you get caught in your emotional uh, habitual tendency of getting more and more excited, either positive or negative, it doesn't matter which one. I had a talk with a psychologist and he was telling me he had a lot of people that were really uh, suffering from alcohol. And he said, what would you do about it? I said, alcohol is no different from any other emotional attachment. So I would teach them how to develop equanimity. And he immediately walked away disgusted like I didn't say something that was actually quite profound. Anyway, the agreeable that arose, the disagreeable that arose, and the both agreeable and disagreeable that arose cease in him when you use the six R's. It might only cease for a brief time and then it comes back because it depends on the strength of your attachment to your ideas, attachment to your concepts and opinions about the way the, the way life is supposed to work. Okay, they 
the cease in him when you use the six R's. And equanimity is established. Just as a man with good sight, having opened his eyes, might shut them, or having his eyes shut, might open them. So too concerning anything at all. That's an important statement. Anything at all. Now, mind is the forerunner of all states, right? You hear that a lot, and I get people to recite that a lot. When, when uh, I'm giving a retreat. And I'm not having you do that just uh, reciting some formula, reciting some words. There, I have you do that even when you get off retreat every day. I recommend it. I recommend it very highly. And I recommend that you think about what the precepts actually are representing. They're representing a wholesome mind that has equanimity in it, that has balance in it. Now, your mindfulness might help catch you uh, with your dissatisfaction that's the easiest to really catch, to be quite honest. And look at what it does to your blood pressure. Look what it does to your heart. Look at what it does to your mind. Your mind becomes hard. Rigid. And the critical mind that habitual tendency of being critical, I'm right and you're wrong, grows as you indulge in it. So there's a big problem that we all have to face. I mean, as a human being. I'm starting to see more and more uh, people try to make a difference because cultures are so different. But every culture is made up of human beings. They might have some things that are agreeable to you. They might have some things that are disagreeable to you. But if you have true equanimity towards them, there is no criticism of them unless, as a human being, they're breaking precepts. So right now this culture in in the west is trying to divide people into groups have you ever heard that song that uh, statement divide and conquer that's what they're trying to do right now but as you truly practice your generosity and be an example of keeping your precepts, you are defeating that idea. You find things to agree with rather than fight over. And the more you can do that, the more balance is going to happen in all society because you affect the world around you. The more you 
develop this balance, this equanimity, the less disagreements you'll have, the attitude of we have to agree to disagree about some things. When you start with that, that puts balance into what you're saying so each side can actually listen instead of close down. So, This is called the Noble One's Discipline, uh, uh, Noble One's dis Disciple. Excuse me, Discipline. My uh, dyslexity is acting up today. Oh, that's good fun. I see words that aren't there sometimes. I see words that aren't in the right order. <laughs> Ah, oh, it's always entertaining. Okay, I'll try this again. This is called the Noble One's Disciple. I did it again. The Noble One's Discipline, the Supreme Development of the Faculties regarding forms cognizable by the eye. Again, When a monk hears a sound with the ear, there arises in him what is agreeable. There arises what is disagreeable. There arises what is both agreeable and disagreeable. And he understands now, sounds, an awful lot of people that are practicing meditation, they do everything they can to make it as quiet as they can. And I did too before I went to Asia. Going to Asia, I go to a meditation retreat and people are whispering. They're uh, coughing, they're belching, they're passing gas, they walk very loudly. That doesn't matter what's happening outside the meditation hall. People can be arguing, people can be talking very loudly, which they have a tendency to do in Asia without respect for the people that are sitting. As a result, a lot of people really don't like sounds. But what's to dislike about a sound? A sound is a sound. It doesn't matter whether it's there or not. Well, I've told the story many times about being in, in Burma where they have a habit of clearing their throat often during the day and they don't, don't do it quietly. And then they hawk, which means spit. They like to chew beetle. And when they're spitting their beetle out, it is kind of a bright, bright cherry red color which is always interesting to be walking down the sidewalk and to see the, the red color, knowing you're, you're walking through spit. But that's part of their culture. And every Westerner that I know complained to their teacher about them making so much noise and the teacher just, well, so what? So you had to develop the mind that said it's okay to hear this stuff 
without getting caught up in it. Now we get back to the six R's. What's the second step of the six R's? It's the second most important part of the meditation. Is letting it go. That means you don't keep your attention on it. You don't keep your attention on the dislike of the sound. The truth is, when you dislike a sound, you're fighting with the Dhamma. You're not practicing the Dhamma, you're fighting it. Because it doesn't meet your standard of what you think things are supposed to be. So you have to back off on that. And again, I told, I've told a lot of people about my experience being in a meditation hall where there's no windows, it's only screen. And right outside the hall, they were drilling for well, for water. And they drilled from about eight o'clock in the morning till about six o'clock in the evening with a motor that is an old World War II motor that didn't have a muffler on it. So it was throwing out a lot of sound. Now, as soon as I started the retreat there and they started doing that, I had to make up my mind either go crazy because I hated the sound or accept the fact that the sound is there and develop equanimity towards it. It was a great lesson. It wasn't a hindrance. But in this country, if there's a clock in the meditation hall and it ticks too loudly, people get upset. Oh, it's let's turn that clock off. We don't need to have that clock. Now, what are they developing? A critical mind? A mind that's attached to their habitual tendency of fighting the present moment, fighting the Dhamma. It's pretty amazing to see people even that are somewhat advanced in their meditation insist that everything be quiet. I was in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, and it was hot. And we were in a room that was pretty well enclosed. They didn't have a lot of windows, but it was, it was over 90 degrees as I remember. And they had a fan in there because they didn't, they didn't want to air condition that part of the building. It cost too much money. And people were doing the meditation. They were supposedly advanced meditators. And they said to the teacher, well, let's turn the fan off. Now, my being a monk, and people respect me a lot, I had to say, no way. A sound is just a sound. You're not teaching the people how to have equanimity towards everything. As a result, the fan stayed on. because it wouldn't have helped to go outside. It was just as hot outside as it was inside. Now that, that's something that we have to really, we have to give up our old ways of demanding that everything be very 
quiet. We have to give up our old habitual tendencies to our ideas, to our concepts and opinions and develop new ones that are accepting. And that's what equanimity does. That helps you to have a more and more balanced state of mind. Again, when a monk smells an odor, when a, when a monk tastes a flavor, when a monk touches a tangible, when a monk cognizes a mind object with mind. See, we're going through all of the faculties and you have to treat all the faculties in the same way, not as disturbance, but think about cognizing your thoughts, your thought objects. Pay more attention to your thought objects. Watch more closely when there's something disagreeable. And that's the time you use the six R's. You don't keep your attention on what is disagreeable. And this cuts out a lot of blaming of other people for things that you don't like. Now, uh, granted, there can be some things that you might not like. But does your anxiety, does your depression, does your hard mind, does your want to push away that aversion make it any better? That's a good question, you know. What kind of pain are you causing yourself when you are fighting with the Dhamma? Now, I heard a lot of uh, psychological uh, babble. Well, I'm just venting. What are you doing when you vent? You're indulging in your hatred of the situation, whatever that happens to be. And you think you're letting it go, but you're actually building it because of the version in your mind that you're not letting go of. A question that I use fairly often with people that come to do the meditation. And that question is, are you willing to change? Are you willing to let go of your old ways of doing things and develop new ways of doing things? And you can't put it on anybody else. When I was with Saida Usilananda, I was his attendant for two years as a layman. At that time, there was a group called EST. And they would have large groups of people get in a room and then try to convince them that they could let go of their anger by beating on a pillow and yelling. And Usil Ananda heard about that and he started laughing. He said, they're just making it worse. That's what venting does. 
it makes it worse because of your attachment, your dissatisfaction. And that can create breaking precepts, saying things that aren't true, that aren't necessarily true, or that are exaggerations. Are you following the Buddha's path when you do that? Or are you just indulging in your old habit, your old way of looking at the world and justify it to yourself and, and try to put the blame for that pain that you're experiencing onto somebody else because they did this or they did that and I'm gonna vent against them. Does that venting ever really go away or does it just lay in wait till the next time you can do it so it can get bigger and more intense? So you can hold on to it for a longer period of time and you are making yourself suffer. That's one of the things that I try to instill in all of my students. And that is there's nothing out there that causes your suffering. You cause your suffering yourself. A long time ago, I used to read a lot of stories in uh, the Reader's Digest. And one of the stories really, it stuck with me for a long time. And it was about some Jews in a concentration camp. And they decided to change their image of the world. And they began to help people if they were sick, they would take care of them. They would give them what they could of food and that sort of thing. And it, it kind of caught on and even the guards became less harsh. Now they were in a situation that is completely disagreeable. And there's a lot of pain in there but they made the best of the situation that they could by practicing their generosity, by helping someone else. There's a lot to generosity, a lot more than people give it credit for. But if you are depressed, Go find somebody that's really suffering. Go visit a hospital that somebody's dying of cancer. They have real pain. It's not a made up mental pain. And try to make them smile. Help them. That's gonna change your personality from depression into a sense of hope where you can actually do something that is helpful, not only to you, but to all of the people around you. You have to be willing to change from Self-centered, I am that, I'm the most important person in the room, I'm the most important, uh, I do the most important things. You have to change it from that to how can I help you to let go of your suffering? A lot of 
times. Even people that are in the hospital that are suffering very, very uh, strongly from physical pain. If you see that they have such aversion to the pain, you don't have to feel hopeless when you walk in the room. Their pain is theirs. You can't feel their pain. You don't know what they're going through. You can say you know that they're suffering. Oh, I know all the pain you're going through and I, I feel sorry for you. Don't feel sorry for them. Love them. Radiate loving kindness and compassion. And that will help the person be more and more at ease and their pain this isn't a maybe i've been with many 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 different people in the hospital and i've seen all kinds of suffering and i've seen some miracles occur Maybe not what you would call a miracle, but it's changing a person's face from anger, sadness, dislike to a smile. That is a miracle. Changing somebody's attitude from a negative attitude to a positive attitude. That is a miracle. And I've seen a lot. Generosity is not some little part of your practice. It's a huge part of your practice. So the more you can affect people around you in a positive way, the more you can have balance when there is uh, a stressful situation. I lived in California for years and years and years. And we always had the fearful anxiety, not all of us, but a lot of us had a fearful anxiety of earthquakes or fires. What good does fear and anxiety of something that doesn't hasn't happened yet, what good does that do? doesn't mean you don't be cautious, of course you do. But it doesn't mean that you worry about it and think about it and having it as a continual arising of the same thoughts over and over again. Anytime you have the same thoughts over and over again, you are caught by craving. Oh, I just gave a talk to some Indonesians online. One of the things that I told them, because this is a big part of their culture, there are people that practice negative uh, negative things. And they can affect you in a negative way. Now, one of the one of the major teachers over there, someone was psychically attacking her. 
and her business went down. And she couldn't figure out what was happening. So she called me and I told her to put loving kindness around the person that's causing the problem and put loving kindness around herself. This is a protection. Now you put loving, it's like you put a bubble around them. About somebody that doesn't really like you for whatever reason. And they want to cause problems for you. You put a bubble of love around them. Then all of the negative thoughts that they have the harmful thoughts that they have, they bounce back to the person that's sending them. The more you can remember to do that, the less problem they will have. But also, I told them the fastest way to overcome fear and anxiety is by laughing. That's a protection for you. Fear and anxiety causes your body to get very tense and cause and can cause all kinds of problems physically because of your mental states. So we get back to what's the basic teaching that I try to show you. Laughing. Having fun smiling doesn't that create a bubble of loving kindness around you doesn't that help helps you but the strange thing is and they can measure this with some of the scientific things if you radiate loving kindness around you, it goes out 500 feet is, is as much as they can measure. I don't believe that. I believe it goes out further than that by a lot. And I've had a lot of examples of people and over problems. There was, I was in America and one of my old students from Malaysia had just had a baby and she had jaundice. And they were very concerned about that. I mean, she, she wasn't, um, I think she was two days old before she started turning yellow. And the, the parents were in fear for their life, for her life. So what they did was call me up and say, what am I supposed to do? And I said, well, you have to start radiating loving kindness to your baby. I know you love your baby, but she needs a little bit extra. She needs a boost. And I will do the same thing. And I started sending loving kindness to the little baby. I can't remember her name right now. And they were in a room with the baby and they saw the color of the baby start changing from jaundice to regular color. And they called up again and they said, when did you start doing that? And I said, well, I started doing that right after you called me 
and they said, whatever you're doing is weird. It's amazing. Even in the room, I can feel your presence. Isn't that a miracle? And it's on the other side of the world. And there's no, I, as, started, as, as soon as I started doing it, things started changing. I was not sending her love in an attached way. I was just wishing her to have a healthy, happy body. You can do the same thing. I'm nothing special. I'm somebody that prefers to be a monk to being a layman, so I have more time to do the things I want to do. That's the only difference between you and me. Why can't you do that for the rest of the world? You will affect the world in a positive way. And it's not only limited to your neighborhood, it's unlimited. That's what a Brahma Vihara is. It's an immeasurable. You can't measure you can't measure how far out that loving kindness goes. You can't expect it to work in the same way all the time because it doesn't. You can expect to see something happen, but it's on its own time frame too. One of the things that I highly recommend everybody do, I want you to get a glass bottle or a, a glass uh, drinking cup that you can put a lid on. And I want you to put distilled water in it. I want you to hold that while you are radiating loving kindness to all beings in all directions. I want you to do it every day for as long as you want to do it. Then if you start feeling a cold coming on, take a sip. If one of your family members starts to get sick, have them drink some, take some in your hand and give them a massage. There is benefit in doing that especially for pregnant women. I radiate loving kindness while holding a, just one time, holding a, a glass or a bottle of water. It has to be distilled water. It can't be bubbly water or tap water. It has to be distilled. Then one of the things that they found out about water is the water holds memory. And that's been proven scientifically. But you have to use the water. Now, if you want to really see results fast, start pouring that water, giving a, a plant a drink that's sickly and watch what happens. All of a sudden they start loving you 
because you're helping them. See, this is a generosity thing again. The more times you can come up with ways to help the world around you in a positive way, please do that and tell us about it. Because that'll inspire a lot of other people to do something that's very positive, that's very helpful. Excuse me. And do that every time you sit, hold that water in your hands. And use that water. Now you go down about half a bottle, fill it up with distilled water, shake it 15 times. I don't know why 15 works, but shake it 15 times. It's infused with that loving kindness, that memory of loving kindness and well-being, and you'll never run out. When I was in Malaysia, pregnant women woman came to me and asked if I would give the bless a blessing to her and her baby. Of course, I did, but I was holding up, radiating loving kindness into the water, and I gave it to her. I told her that anytime the baby starts feeling restless in her, her tummy, uh, to take some of the water and rub it on her tummy and massage the baby and be radiating loving kindness while they do that. I also recommended that they practice loving kindness not only to the baby, but to all beings. When the baby was born, they called me up and told me uh, that it was going to happen. So I started radiating loving kindness to her while she was uh, going through a, a kind of stressful event. And she the baby came out quickly, not a whole lot of pain, and came out smiling. And the baby was doing weird things, like sleeping all night. That never happens, but it did. And the word got out that I did that sort of thing. And all of a sudden, I had an awful lot of pregnant women coming to me, asking me to bless the bottle and, and radiate loving kindness into it. And all the babies came out very happy, good natured, ready to smile. I remember I went to this one family. The baby had been born about two weeks before. And they said, you want to see our baby? And I said, well, yeah. And as soon as the baby saw me, the baby was on his stomach. And he saw me. He started to smile. And then he put his hands together like that. like he knew I was a monk and he knew that I had helped him in one way or another. And I did because I was radiating loving kindness to him. I gave him that water to be used. And uh, that was 
maybe 25 years ago. And I didn't see the baby again because I left about, about 24, 22 years ago. I had to come back to America. I went back to Malaysia and I met him or her. And they recognized me. Now, how could that, isn't that a miracle? I haven't seen a baby since it was two weeks old. And years and years later, the, ba the, the person recognizes me like we have some kind of a bond. I thought, that, that's really amazing. And I started talking to his parents about him or her and how they were doing. And they said, oh, they're very strict keeping their precepts. And they're, they're living good lives and they're, they're having a lot of fun with their friends and, and relatives. And they spend quite a time, quite a lot of time going to uh, orphanages and old people's homes to help them to be happy. And uh, they take uh, food and clothing and, and toys and things like that to them. And he said, they, they spend their whole time doing that. Wow. Isn't that a miracle? I guess it comes from a good start. Of course, the parents had a lot to do with that too, but it wasn't all me. But seeing the results made me happy. And it built up my confidence the more you do this, the more you see the positive outcome, the more disenchantment you have with worldly things, the more you practice your generosity, the more you're gonna see wonderful things happen. And it's up to you. That's what life is for. Life isn't about getting a job and earning a living. Life is about living with a mind that's happy and uplifted as much as possible. So life, all life is not suffering. It's your choice whether you go get into that suffering or not. and making the best out of whatever the problem was. So I've been talking for a long time and you, you get an idea of why I like the sutta because it is development of the faculties towards equanimity towards balance of mind, which leads to happiness and con contentment and clarity. And that rubs off on other people around you. So I've been talking for a long time, actually over an hour, wow. It's amazing. Time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> so I hope I gave you something to think about. And you all have that willingness to change so you can have balance in your life all the time. I wish you happiness. Now, do you have any questions?
come on, you have to have some question. You have a question, Karen? Huh? Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Um, Your face is very light and bright. Thank you. <laughs> that, that tells me that you've been doing your practice and that makes me happy. Yes, every day. <laughs> Excellent. So what's your question? Um, I didn't have one, but I had a comment. <laughs> okay. So when I had sat my first online retreat, um, you know, in an Asian household, so it's really loud, everyone's yelling. <laughs> I was yeah. so angry and I'm not normally angry. <laughs> so I was sitting, I was like, everyone knows I'm meditating. They should be quiet. And uh, <laughs> people next door to me had their TV on. And I was like, oh, I was so angry that I was gonna you know, smash the wall. I don't know what came over me. I was angry. And I was like, no, this, I remember what Banti said. It's just me creating this issue. <laughs> so I just sat with it and it took maybe a few days. And then eventually, yeah, it just that I was hearing the same sound from the TV, same yelling, and uh, I just wasn't <laughs> wasn't wasn't bothered by it anymore. So the six hours worked. Ah, <laughs> uh, see, it works. <laughs> yeah, it did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and now, yeah, I'm basically I can sit through anything. <laughs> I <Perfect>. think <laughs> so far, so far, <laughs> so far, I can sit through anything. <laughs> Perfect. It really makes me happy that you have learned a great lesson. Now, one of the things that you have to remember is that if you don't practice every day, you're going to forget. And then you'll get caught up in again. But the more you practice, the more you make it a habit of having that equanimity the less it will bother you. But you get a chance to see how much pain you cause yourself. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I see a lot of other people smiling because of what you said. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe knowing smiling. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, maybe not. <laughs> you, you affected a lot of people right here just by what you said. I'm glad. Excellent. Sadhu. Sadhu. <laughs> Anyone else have a question? Hello. 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 Uh, um, I don't have a, well, yes, I have one question, but I also wanted to tell you because you advised that I do the forgiveness meditation. Yes. So I did for the last three weeks and uh, it's wonderful. I have the feeling something uh, melting in me. I'm melting. Something gets excellent. very soft. Yeah. And uh, my father died last year and yesterday I had this wonderful experience that he looked into my eyes in the meditation with so much love and uh, it was exactly how it is described in the book or how you describe it in your video and, I, and it did happen it works yeah <laughs> I believe you. Yeah, it's wonderful. Every, every time something like that happens, it gives you more and more confidence that, yes, you are on the right path. Yeah. And I thank you so much. It's so wonderful. Really, it's life-changing. And it, change, it changes my whole environment around me also. Good. It's amazing. Now, if you thank want you to very continue... Much. Yeah if, yeah, if you want to continue on with that, ask yourself a question. Do I need to do more forgiveness or should I go back to loving kindness? Your mind will give you the answer. 
Okay. Yeah, it's not. I don't find it so easy with the intuition yet. But yeah. Well, mm -hmm. it, it, you'll get the answer. It's it's just it's only going to mm -hmm. happen one time, and you have to really be paying attention to it. You mm -hmm. will. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You've cleared, have... you've cleared a lot of things away that were blocking you from being able mm -hmm. to hear your intuition. So this is going to be kind of new for you. Yeah. So maybe I continue for a while. Okay. Yeah. I have one more question. Okay. In one of your talks some weeks ago, um, you said that uh, women have a different function than men and, um, Yes, they can. So I was wondering whether uh, being reborn from from one life to the next one is one always is the gender always the same? Like no, always, it changes oh, just okay. like it changes different to different beings. Okay. And then in the Jataka tales, it talks about one of the the foremost monks and his past lifetimes. And he spent a lot of time as a bird <laughs> and a lot of times in the heavenly realms. And then he, he was, it was not, uh, the heavenly realms can either be male or female. And as I remember, he he was a female in a few of those heavenly realms. And he was reborn as a male. Yeah. So okay. it depends it depends on, on on your past actions, your past lifetimes, what you've done. But it's it's a blessing being being a female. It's different from being a man. And your perspective is a little bit different. One of the things that the Buddha said that was kind of comical in, in the Anguttara Nikaya, when he was asked about the difference between men and women, and the Buddha said, men think about women, women think about men. <laughs> And that seems to be true. <laughs> but honestly, as some of the, still some of the literature, some of the suttas have mistakes in them. And they're prejudicial mistakes. Uh, and they're, they're actually cultural mistakes because in, in a lot of cultures, women are second class. And one of the things that, that it says is that a woman can never lead a country, can never be a leader. Well, that's just not true. Women can be leaders. One of the reasons that women can't be reborn as a Buddha a Buddha is always male, is there are physical differences and they couldn't go out and do as strenuous a thing as a lot of, or as men do, because they're physically not capable. And they're, they're mentally, they're capable, of course. But physically, there is some problems. Being in a forest where there's wild animals and a, a scent of a woman draws wild animals to it. But a scent of a man doesn't. And that can be a major problem when you're working to become fully awake. I mean, that would take you out of one, one realm and put you in another because uh, that animal would attack a lion or a bear or whatever. 
So that doesn't happen for men near as much. And I, and this is a personal opinion on my part. It just makes sense because of that slight physical difference and you can give birth, which is amazing and is truly wonderful. And one of the other things that I started thinking deeply about, about the differences between men and women, men have a tendency to be linear thinking. And women have a tendency to be group thinking. And you see that in large corporations where there's uh, some women that are uh, leaders and they, they t have a tendency to temper the brashness of men. And they come out with more um, balanced perspectives. And again, this is personal. It's not what the Buddha said. But it's just my idea. We're different and thank God for the difference. Because women, they're always going to be more protective than men are. So a woman, it, say in business, makes men from not being as aggressive and making mistakes. And they give a perspective that puts things in more in balance, that has a tendency to be more successful. Now that's not 100%, but what is? But that's my observation. And I got a lot of this observation from watching the, uh, she was, I guess, I, I don't know what they call it over there in Iceland. She was the leader in Iceland. And on her advising committee, she had it about equal between men and women and the, thing, the way they would discuss things and come up with solutions for things. She said it was a lot different than going to a corporation that was all male. And they had to have much more tendency to be aggressive, abusive, hard. And while she was the leader there, the uh, Iceland just blossomed. It was really amazing to watch uh, how they tended to, they might argue with each other, but they tended to agree at the end and both sides were satisfied. And as a result, that affected that whole island because of the balance of women to men. So I hope that helps. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Anybody else have a question? Hi, Bonte. Hey. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask you a quick question about one of the links in dependent origination. The um, Baba that you translate as um, habitual tendencies, or, right. um, and most people translate as being. I've also seen it translated as existing and uh, becoming. But I was listening, I was listening to um, your friend and uh, brother monk um, 
the late Bhante Punaji. I have some talks of his, and he's describing it. And I think I understand, um, can you help me make sure I understand correctly? The, the issue when you use being, for example, is that uh, we're bringing, um, we're taking it as self, yeah. uh, a process that is actually becoming, we're actually changing, but we're taking it to be. Well, um, yeah, that, that's true. Is that true? Yeah. I, I had a long talk with him about it. And as he was describing what he was saying, he would he it wasn't satisfied with the, those uh, translations either, but he used them, and he was always looking for a different translation. But when I was talking with him when he would mention bhava and we we're talking about dependent origination and it, it went through the whole thing. But every time he said bhava, because he wouldn't translate it as becoming or existence, he didn't like those. Uh, so he used the word bhava. I would translate it in my mind to habitual tendency and that made it agree with everything that he said. Now, Usil Ananda, who was a brilliant translator, and he taught me a lot about the philosophy of translating and what, what was really needed. And I went to him and I said, I have come across this and it seems right to me, the habitual tendency. And he thought about it for a little while and he said, yes, that's right. And he seemed to think that it was a closer translation than becoming because of the understanding is more clear. And you say existence, what does that really mean? It means being something. But uh, the uh, harmonious uh, perspective of becoming is true and bhava is just a, a tricky Pali word. It might have something completely different at the time of the Buddha than it does now, but we can only go with our gut on, on some things. Yeah, I like I like your translation. It helped me actually understand it because I never understood that link when I read it before. And I get it. It's the um, reaction. Right. Right. And, and that really helps. And, and that could, that could, it, it's the reaction of becoming. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, but it that, does. That's complicated. It is. I was just trying to tie together what Bhante Punaji was saying and trying to understand it with what, how you define it. And I think yeah. I sort of have it. But um, thank you for your explanation. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Bhante. Okay. Bhante uh, and I, and we agreed a lot about a lot of things, but not about all things. I understand. Yeah. We, we agreed to disagree. It was always a joy to hang out with him for a few days. Because of the different opinions, that made our uh, discussions quite lively sometimes. And that, that was fun. That was good. There was only loving kindness and compassion in both of us agreeing that we wanted to understand more deeply. And that's why we explored the way we did. He was a great teacher. Yeah. I, yeah these talks are priceless. I, I, I love them. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Okay, anybody else have a question?
or a comment? Hello, Bante. Thank you for your talk. Um, I have a quick question. Um, I started listening to a talk. I, I didn't hear the entire talk, so I, I can't attest to it. But the gist of it was that the person was arguing that thinking of dependent origination as, as a mental states that we can experience and recognize was a mistake and that dependent origination is really more on a grand scale, how you know people are reborn and what keeps us tethered to samsara, but it's not something that we're gonna recognize, you know, like individual no. that it's not like a psychological experience. Mm -hmm. So I didn't hear the whole thing in this whole argument, but it just made me curious um, if you have any thoughts well, about I, or I you heard that, that opinion. I find that kind of interesting. Because I think it's Sutta number 28. Sariputta was talking to somebody and he said, when you talk about dependent origination, you're talking about Dhamma. When you're talking about Dhamma, you're talking about dependent origination. That person's opinion isn't as... Uh, clarifying as I think it could have been. And it tells me that he was just reading and getting his own opinions from what he's read and studied, mm -hmm. but he hasn't practiced. Because you do see dependent origination when you practice. I, I, yes, I just wanted to get your uh, your opinion because I felt like it. You can experience this, and if yeah. you're saying that, I don't know how you can look down the psychological experience of dependent origination. Right. But I didn't hear the whole thing. It just seemed like. Yeah. I just no, didn't it's want to it's his, his opinion, and uh, it's just not something that I would say is as correct as it could be. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Hi, Bonte. Hello. It's good to see you. It's good to see you too. How have you been? Uh, uh, I've been pretty good. Um, um, practice has been consistent. You know, life kind of still has its ups and downs. Yeah. Um, but the, the practice has been um, very helpful for me. Yeah. So I'm very yeah. grateful. Very grateful for the Dhamma. Uh, I'm happy for you. Mm, you, have you, you have a question? I do. I, I potentially have a few questions. Um, they're all kind of about intuition. So I'll, I'll just start with one of them. Uh, how do you... How do you recognize intuition and how do you kind of distinguish it from just chatter? Well, the thing with the meditation is that you uh, have a quieter kind of mind all the time. When you ask a direct question to your intuition, you know that it's going to give you an answer. So you start being more attentive and waiting for that answer to come. Uh, there's a lot of other cultures that, that talk about intuition and using it. And Huna was one of the cultures, a Hawaiian... Uh, way, I guess you could say. And they uh, were talking about the more you use your intuition and pay attention to your quiet voice, the more you become uh, familiar with it. 
Uh, they, but they did give an example as this guy, he uh, was driving his car and his intuition came up and he said, uh, turn here. And he didn't follow it. And he got into, uh, there was an accident and he got into a situation where he couldn't turn around and go back and he had to wait through it. And he was frustrated by that because he didn't pay attention to that quiet voice. You'll know that it's correct. But it'll just come up and it'll go. Walk into that store. Now that's an unusual kind of thought. That's not your everyday, I'm going to go in that store. You didn't intend to go into that store. But if you go into the store, you might meet someone that can be helpful to you in one way or another. Now when, when I'm talking about intuition, I'm being a little not so general, although it will start to develop on its own. I'm, it's more specific of asking it questions and then paying attention to the answer, following the answer. If you don't follow the answer, what's going to happen is the, the problem that you're trying to solve, the, the question you're trying to answer, you're, the intuition is going to say, well, you don't pay attention to me. Why should, why should I come back to you? So it's like it, it, it has a, a memory. Well, you didn't pay attention before. I'm not going to give you an answer this time. <laughs> so pay attention to that, that gut feeling, as it were. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Monte. I love that. Um, I actually have one more question, and I think you're like just kind of touching on it. Because um, you talk about asking your intuition, is there sort of a, do you want to be in like a, a deep state, a quiet state when you're asking, or are there sort of, well, should you be selective? Yeah. It's the asking, it's not the state you're in at that time, but you want to be in an alert state. Now, in Sutta number 127, the Buddha talked about intuition and how to use it. He talked about the question. Uh, what's the cause and condition that this is blocking my way? Why is it doing that? Now, he didn't have a teacher that could give him an answer. He was all by himself. And he started seeing the importance of the intuition and asking those questions. This was long before he became awakened. He figured out that by, by noticing when he asked his intuition a question that he always got an answer from it and it was correct. Then he started trusting it and then he started using it while he was doing his sitting meditation. But you can use your intuition at any time. What? I have a friend that um, he went out into the forest and got lost. And he used his intuition on what direction he needed to walk so that he saw something familiar. And he followed his intuition and he was only lost for an hour, two hours, something like that. And then he came out of the, out of the woods. So trusting your intuition is, a, is an important facet in all different parts of your life. You can ask your intuition. Uh, sometimes 
you can have a feeling of um, it's you go into a store and you you just don't feel right. Well, your intuition is telling you it's time to leave. Don't stay in there. That can be troublesome for you. And you can have intuition about people that they might wish you harm in one way or another. So you have an intuition that says, uh, let's go a different way. I don't want to be around this. Now, it's important for women because they can be attacked and harmed. But if they trust her intuition, you feel like if I walk down this way, I don't feel comfortable. Well, don't walk down that way. Follow what your, your intuition says. Trust it. Okay. Great. Thank you, Bonte. Okay. Um, yeah, I have one more question, actually. Okay. For, um, so I've had the experience where sort of uh, practicing asking my intuition, and it's sort of a question that I'm uh, brings the question itself is like, I'm scared to ask it, basically. And <laughs> I'll get even but <laughs> you even before I finish asking the question, I'll get like a very loud sort of like a uh, very strong, almost like reactive. And I'm in those situations, I'm really curious if like that sort of reactive voice, even before I finish asking, like, what? is that intuition or is it, you know, it can be. Hmm. Uh, generally it's a quieter kind of voice, but it can be a loud voice. Pay attention to it. You don't have to be afraid of the intuition. It's going gonna, it's gonna to tell you the right thing. It might not be what you, quote, want. But you'll figure out later that, yeah, it, it's a good thing I didn't do that. Because it would have caused so many problems. So it's really just about practicing with it. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Hi, Dan. Hi, Hi. Bante. I have a uh, similar like uh, question about my uh, like intuition. Like sometimes I find it like things that is going out like very quick and fast that it becomes. Um, something that I wasn't able to, it's become reactive instead of responsive, that it's kind of like a, a dagger, like it's too quick and it's trying to beat like the mind, beating it the can, other mind. So how should I handle it, that? It can be quick, <laughs> it be, can be quiet, but you will know that it's the right answer. Unless mm. You have such a strong opinion that you want it to be this, you want it to be that, that it overshadows the intuition and it gets into your desires. Yeah. Sometimes it's, uh, we, it I see be myself fast, being it can too be so. I've asked a question and, and a heavy philosophical question. That's the way my mind works on how this actually works and how uh, the speed of things actually occur and does it always have to be in the same order according to dependent origination. Those kind of questions I ask myself. And my intuition might work on that for half and half a month or two months sometimes even up to a year before some kind of thing shows me what the, uh, how to answer that question. It can be intuition, it can be an experience that my intuition pulled up. 
but just general everyday kind of questions, especially about hindrances. Why is this coming? Uh, people that have nightmares, generally speaking, I tell them to start forgiving something that they've done in the past and that they'll come up with the answer through their intuition. Their intuition might give you a name of someone that uh, did something in, in your past life that caused you a lot of anxiety and pain and fear and and when you do the forgiveness, you can, you can forgive while you're in the dream. You can forgive the, the scary thing while you're in the dream. And that will change it and it will become much more peaceful and calm, your dream. Yeah. But you have to be you have to be able to to discern whether it is intuition or its opinion of something that you want to see happen. Generally, it's yes, no kind of questions that you need to ask, not opinions. But all it can also be. Um, should I get involved with this group or that group? Ask your intuition. It'll give you a yes or no. Might even give you a reason why you should or shouldn't get involved with them. Trust it. The more you use your intuition, the more confidence you have in it, the easier it is to find out. Um, yeah, I do find the meta like uh, as an object is like harmonizing the two like um, set of uh, thoughts that's been going on with like a, uh, a rational mind and then a emotional like uh, the fighting and that matter is to me is one way that I find it a balancing factor in many ways for that respond reactive. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's true. Thank you very much. Yeah, Bhante. Yeah. Be happy. Anyone else? Yeah. Hello. Now that we're on this topic, I do have a question. <laughs> so, um, okay. so every day we, you know, recite the Dhammapada verses, right? So seeing the essential as essential and seeing the unessential as unessential. So I've always wondered about that. And especially now that you've mentioned discernment. So is that where intuition is where we would see it? Right. Okay. Trust your intuition, then the unessential won't grab onto you. Okay? Yeah, thanks. Because, <laughs> you know, in the past, especially, I found so many things that was so unessential, but I felt it was so essential, right? <laughs> so every day I read the verses and I'm like, oh, <laughs> that's what I was doing before. So it's better now. <laughs> so I was wondering about that because um, uh, but no, I, I guess uh, the precepts is helping helping that a lot. Oh yes. It puts a bubble around you too. And it, it helps your mind be more alert. So you will know what you're going to do or say before you do it so you can trust your intuition to push you in the correct way. Thank you, Pepe. Okay. Boy, her face.
case. It's just amazing. I have a question. Yeah. Hi. I uh, <clears throat> was uh, starting to meditate uh, the other day, and uh, I, this has never happened before. Uh, all of a sudden, I was just totally flooded in fear, and it was like almost like a panic attack. And I'd only been meditating maybe seven minutes or so. But it was, it was like, it was so overwhelming. I, I tried to 6R and I tried everything I could and I, it just kept intensifying. So I had to quit. So I don't know, what, what do you, do I should? You had, I don't a, know. You had a release. Oh. You, you okay. let go of some kind of attachment. And generally speaking, you had tears of joy. And you tried to push the tears of joy away. And they didn't pay attention. It kept coming back. Oh, interesting. Oh. You know, when you got done with your tears, did you feel lighter? <coughs> yeah, I did. Ah, good one. That does happen sometimes. It's not anything to be upset by. Depending on where you are in your meditation, you can get into the highest form of joy, which is called all-pervading joy. Now, this all-pervading joy, it'll open your eyes up. All of a sudden, you're, you feel it's, it's a very, uh, not excited, but happy, deep down happy feeling and contentment. And all of a sudden, your eyes pop open. Okay. You, you didn't. You didn't try to make it happen. It just happened by itself. And so you close your eyes, and your eyes want to be open, so they'll come, pop open again. So you don't fight with it. You just go, okay. You want to be open? Be open. I don't care. You're not looking at anything in particular. But it's just one of the functions that happens with that kind of joy. It's the awakening factor of joy. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah. I have one more question about the forgiveness. Okay. Um, be I, before I was, I was um, radiating loving kindness to the directions. And as far as I read, um, now I'm. I went back to radiate meta or forgive myself, having the object of the heart again. Is that uh -huh. right? But today, after having this experience yesterday, there's this strong wave trying to get back up into my head, and I was repeating the forgiveness to kind of stay there. Okay, let, let go of the forgiveness for a day or two. Mm -hmm. And do the, the six directions with a loving kindness. Okay. And don't forget to use your beautiful smile. I, okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Anyone else with a question? Michael. Hey. Yes, I have a quick question. Thank you. Is there, uh, as you may describe, that a connection between... I've, I'm having trouble hearing you. You have to turn your mic up a little. Okay. Hold on. Um, is that better? That, yeah. Uh, is there a connection between um, intuition and you often repeat uh, the, In, uh, intuition and what? The, the uh, reminder that we are our own teacher. We are teaching. You're listening us. to your own intuition. Yes. So is there like a direct line between when you say, you know, you are your own teacher? There, there's, there's the direct line of your striving to the wholesome and that's what the 
intuition gives you. Mm. So that, that offers some discernment, would you say? To... Of course, that helps with discernment. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Bhakti. <laughs> God, you look great. Your face is just radiant. Oh, I, I love it when people are so successful with their meditation. I absolutely love it. Oh, well, thank you for it. Great just job. seeing your face as bright as it is makes me smile all through my body. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. Any other question? Then let's share some merit. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. I wish all of you a happy week. Thanks, Monty. Thank you, Thank you very much. You oh, you're very welcome. Thank you, Bunny.